Well, as Johnny and I mentioned, uh, we weren't here last week, and uh, James Gerber preached last week, did a great job. Can we say thank you to James? Excellent message. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it's, it's good to be back. <laughs> uh, 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 several people said, we missed you last week. And I thought, you know, I have it worse. You missed, you know, one person or five of us, the five hovits. But I, I missed a couple hundred of you. So it was much harder for me. <laughs> it's really good to be back. It is really good to be back. Well, would you stand with me as we read the scriptures together? We're going to read a larger chunk. So you only read the words in bold. OK, so when the bold words come up, that's what you're reading. And I'll read the rest. Here is the scriptures this morning out of Genesis. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit, and she ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and that they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? The woman said, the serpent tricked me and I ate. The word of the Lord. <laughs> Judah saying amen. That's what he is, right? A police officer pulled up in my driveway, and I was all of five years old. And my mom looked at me and said, Isaac, they're coming for you. <laughs> now, as an adult, I now know that the police usually come for the adults. I should have seen this diversion plan of my mother. The police were probably coming for you and dad. Aha, you're a part of the Norwegian mafia, are you? Now, the Norwegian mafia is just like the Italian mafia. mafia except for paler, <laughs> a bit quieter, and obviously doing a very good job of keeping themselves a secret. Because until right now, you did not know the Norwegian Mafia existed, did you? <laughs> they were coming for me. Knock, knock, knock. Mr. and Mrs. Hovitt, your son was seen doing something that he shouldn't have done. And then the police officer asked me if indeed I had been at the scene of the crime. An abandoned house in our neighborhood, breaking out a window with another group of Norwegian mafia. That's yes. <laughs> That's what I was doing. Oh my goodness. I was terrified. It was true. I was overwhelmed by having to pay back the money for broken. I was five years old. Unemployment was terrible in the 80s, <laughs> particularly for five-year-olds. But I was caught. I wanted to run. I felt 
shame. Since that day, I've had many encounters with my own sinfulness. Nearly 40 years later, and I still am afraid of being found out. <laughs> I still want to hide. I know that I can't atone for every sin. Have you felt that way before, too? Yeah. The terrible lie steals joy by convincing us to disobey and then beating us over the head with shame. It is indeed a terrible lie. It is a terrible lie to be told that God doesn't love us. It is a terrible lie that is really easy for us to believe. Think about this with me. Once the lie was believed by Adam and Eve, sin and damage were brought into the world. The effects of sin created a downward spiral of more hurt, more pain, and more and more separation between people. That hurt and that pain makes God seem more and more distant. And so it is difficult for us to believe that God loves us and actually has really good intentions for us. In other words, that terrible lie, the results of it make it easier and easier and easier for us to believe the lie as truth. You may have heard it said that human beings are born sinful. One way that we could define that, one way that that is perhaps true, is this. It's on the screen. If you're taking notes, humans are born predisposed to believe the lie of the devil rather than the truth of God. It's like we're predisposed to feel so far away from God, predisposed to believe that lie that, I don't know, God doesn't love us. Look at this mess. Look at this difficulty. Every time humans sin against each other, do evil to one another, they provide, we provide, another set of evidence that God doesn't love us. It's terrible. It's terribly sad. It's terribly easy to believe. It's terribly disastrous in effect. Effectively, we become trapped. So what could interrupt this terrible spiral? Well, we'll get to that. But I'd like for us to take this morning a longer look at what sin and disobedience does. The effect of sin on us is embedded right into this origin story. And I don't think we have to try very hard to admit that we all continue to be affected by this terrible lie that God doesn't love us and doesn't want us to have joy in this world and doesn't want the best for us and really wants us to be miserable if he exists at all. A terrible lie. Okay, so how do you know that you are a child of Adam and Eve? There's three points that I want to make, three symptoms, and what God has and is doing about it through Jesus Christ. So I think you'll find yourself, and it's okay to chuckle at ourselves when we discover the effects of sin within our lives. The first point is this, for those of you at home taking notes, or in the building taking notes, hello everybody online. First point is this, that we, because of sin and disobedience and believing that lie, we are overly aware of ourselves. Genesis 3 and 7, then the eyes of both Adam and Eve were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. It was like they just suddenly like, recognized, like, oh, look at us. Put some clothes on. <laughs> and aware of their presence. Or before this all took place, they were aware of God's creation and participating with it and were aware of God and, enjoy, and enjoying him. And now it's I'm concerned about it myself. Well, you and I live in a society where wealth and affluence enable us to live endlessly self-focused. We are so aware of ourselves as individuals who seek to overcome our self-focus through distraction and achievement. The terrible lie lives in a culture like ours that really focuses 
on the individuals. We become very self-focused and aware of ourselves. We are so free that we leave the most essential questions of our existence up to each individual. This is a quote from Stanley Hauerwas in a book called Resident Aliens, talking about the kind of society that we live in and one of the effects of it. He writes this, Western democracies, like ours, tend to have a problem with meaning. They promise their citizens a society in which each citizen is free to create his or her own meaning. Meaning which, for most of us, becomes little more than the freedom to consume at ever higher levels. Because individual freedom is of paramount importance to our society, our whole society is built around satiating the individual and telling you all the time to be more and more self-focused, which is participating with that terrible lie. The cycle produces consumeristic, indulgent, selfish people who mainly interact with the world transactionally. And when we engage with the world transactionally, we are shaped into worth makers rather than worth receivers. A part of the terrible lie and a part of being self-focused then means, and especially in a context like ours, I need to create meaning, I need to achieve that meaning, and I need to uh, do whatever I can transactionally to get some meaning so that I can feel like I'm worthy. God. James did a great job pointing it last week. We are made worthy in his image and likeness. We don't have to produce anything to become worthy. We are simply worthy as being his children. But the terrible lie tells us, oh, now go prove yourself that you are really something in this broken world. We've used this definition of sin before. And we use the word telos in here, which, which simply means like vision or what you're looking towards or what you're aiming at. Here's the definition. This is what sin, or one way that we can define sin and help to understand it. Sin is thinking, acting, and living to a fearful, selfish telos, that vision, that demands we make worth rather than receive worth, which invariably distorts the image of God and destroys relationship. We become overly focused on ourself. But what has Jesus done about it? He has interrupted this in the most profound way. Jesus draws our attention away from ourselves and on to him. The life, the death, the teaching of Jesus will forever pull our eyes from ourselves and on to him. Some have questioned, why did God need to do something so brutal as himself dying on the cross so that we, all men might be saved? One way to answer that would be to understand that God needed to do something so significant and unexpected so that our eyes would be forever caught. That Christianity, the symbol of Christianity, is the cross of Jesus Christ, a means of execution. And it arrests our attention and it takes our focus off of ourselves onto the one who was not thinking of himself, but was thinking of us. And each time we receive of communion, as we do every week, we are again fixing our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 2, says this. Therefore, and he's just referenced a bunch of people in the faith since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Let's read verse 2 out loud. Ready? Go. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding his shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Jesus interrupts that terrible lie and says, I am making you worthy as you were already made in myself. Now just fix your eyes on me. The second observation that we make about what sin does, we think God wants to punish us. We think this is God's motive, that he's out to get us. If he exists at all, he's just wanting to make my life miserable to stick it to me. 
Adam and Eve were afraid of God. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. When we believe the terrible lie, we take upon ourselves the terrible burden of being like God, knowing good and evil. That's, if you remember what the, the enemy, the, what the serpent said is like, you will know like God, being able to discern good from evil. And once we are in this mindset of having to discern good and evil, we are then obligated to discern the motive of God. Adam and Eve hid from God, thinking that his motive perhaps was punishment. We don't have within ourselves, apart from a loving connection with God, the ability to ascertain his motive. But once we are in that place of thinking that we can know like God, discerning good from evil, we are forever put into this loop of having to discern his motive and we always come to the wrong conclusion thinking that God is out to get us or to punish us. Later in the scriptures, we learn about God's heart and motive. Danya referenced the chesed love of God. <laughs> Let's say it again, chesed, <laughs> yes. God is speaking to Moses about himself in Exodus 34. And this is, I love the message paraphrase here. God, God is speaking of himself. God passed in front of him and called out, God, God, a God of mercy and grace, endlessly patient, so much love, so deeply true, loyal in love for a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. Still, he doesn't ignore sin. He holds sons and grandsons responsible for a father's sins to the third and even fourth generation. God doesn't ignore sin. It is a terrible lie, but his love intends to heal the world. God's intention is to heal and restore and renew and to rebuild and to, and to take everything back into the, the way it was meant to be originally. We, as James pointed out last week, we see that in Revelation that God is making all things new and heaven and earth come together in completeness again and in unity. This is God's heart and his intention. Yes, there will be judgment where we all will be discerned by God, our hearts and our actions and what we've done. But that judgment is not with his intent to punish, but to cleanse and to purify and to fully heal. That is the motive of God that we see within the scriptures. And Jesus, he has taken whatever punishment that we deserve. On the cross, Jesus himself bore the sins of the whole world, God's heart is to redeem. God's heart is to heal, to interrupt the cycle of lies, of death and destruction, to undo what has been done. Only a God who bore the sins of the world could actually interrupt that cycle. Hebrews, again, chapter 10 the writer says this, and so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest, Jesus, who rules over God's house, let us go right in the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. That is God's heart for us. How do we discern God? We look at Jesus. How do we know what his motive is? We look at Jesus. This is how we know God loves us, that Christ Jesus died for us. Jesus has borne, has taken our punishment. And now the last observation about how the effect of sin and the terrible lie and how it works out in our lives. Number three, we deflect responsibility. <laughs> we blame others. The man said, <clears throat> just know, note how he says this. The man said, the woman whom you gave to me, by the way, <laughs> She gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. It's like he barely says that, and I ate. Okay, I ate. 
Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it you have done? And the woman said, the serpent <laughs> tricked me and I ate. Everybody point your finger at your neighbor. It is the rudest thing you can do. Yeah, exactly. It is the most natural thing to do, though, because we're doing it all the time. It's finger pointing all of the time. Think about the political scene that we live in. This is, the terrible lie is affecting us all. Think about the political scene. When's the last time you heard a politician say, you know what, it's my fault? <laughs> or, man, our, our party really got it wrong. Really got it wrong, and we're sorry about that. Like ever? No, no. It is all blame, isn't it? It is just like, it is, it is your, if you would, it, you, it is you, and it's you, and this, all oh, this, you know. You. <laughs> and, and how well does that work, by the way? Super good. Yeah, super, super good. No, but this is the effect the terrible lie. When you believe that you are not in God's love, you are defensive. You are feeling like you have to defend your own sense of worth or dignity, and that comes out in every relational context, particularly in families and marriages, because we feel like we have to defend our own honor. But again, we were created with honor and dignity already. And if we didn't believe the terrible lie, we would not be so tempted and so prone to blame and to deflect. I have noticed that I am ever and ever prone to blame others. Blame all of you. <laughs> you know, as a pastor, you got a lot of people you can blame all the time. No, I'm just kidding. I, I'm prone to do that, to feel defensive. Back to that story when I was five years old. You know, the truth is out. I had been a part of that scene. And I was at the neighbor's house like the next week or something. And she, the mom, you know, as sometimes moms feel like they have to do, to make sure you know that you've done something wrong, you know. And so she wanted to, you know, make sure that I knew. She says, you should have never done that. You should have never, you know, been there. You should have never broken out the window. And you know what I said? I was five years old and I had this theological awareness. And I said, the devil made me do it. That's what I said. I, said, I wanted to deflect. I don't want to take responsibility. The devil, now, perhaps the devil was tempting me. Yeah, probably. But did the devil, anyway, blame. And that continues to live. Well, Jesus... Every story of scripture whispers his name. And down the road from the garden, history would unfold. And it would be nations formed and tribes, and there'd be fighting and so much pain between them, and there'd be so much dysfunction, and there'd be murder, and there would be just terrible things that would unfold. But down through history, God saw people people of Abraham. And one of Abraham's sons was Isaac, and Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob would be renamed to Israel. And he would have 12 sons that would become this nation of people, and one of those would be Judah. And out of the tribe of Judah would come eventually this boy, born in a stable, Jesus, who later somebody recognized and said, son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. That boy would grow to be a man who would teach in the most profound way. He would teach this way of love, even loving our enemies and those who would be opposed to us. This way of forgiveness. How much? A forever forgiveness is what he said. This man of love, this God of love. And then he would be lifted onto that cross and he would bear the terrible lie upon himself. And while he was on the cross, he would say, oh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that moment, Look like everything would be undone. Jesus died. 
He was put into the tomb and all hope seemed to be lost. But on that third day, he rose again. And in his resurrection, he assured that the terrible lie was finally and never to be true again. How do we know that God loves us? This is how we know that he gave a son for us to die for us, to be raised for us so that we can have life now and forevermore. Jesus heals us and then he enables us to be able to take responsibility for our own actions. How could a five-year-old little boy who felt defensive, he wanted to blame the enemy, his friends, the Norwegian mafia. <laughs> How is it that that boy could be given worth and dignity again? Only through Jesus Christ. So then I could take responsibility for my actions, knowing that I'm healed, forgiven, loved, despite myself. John writes about this in his letter to the early church in 1 John. He says, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. God is undoing that terrible lie through his son. And he wants to tell you today that he loves you, that his heart for you is for good, for restoration, victory, and healing, and hope. We are called to disbelieve that lie that God doesn't love us and instead believe the truth of his chesed love, this always abounding, never giving up sort of love that is for you it is for me to rest in. Well, every story of the scriptures whispers the name of Jesus. And this account in Genesis 3 shows us what went wrong, shows us what went wrong so that we know we're not crazy. Yes, some things are wrong. Yes, we've been set up poorly by our ancestors, but also, yes, God has done something about it and is doing something about it. Some points of application. Just a reflective question. What are you afraid of being found out for? Can I just tell you that God's grace, forgiveness, can reach to every corner of your existence, your actions, your thoughts, your motives, your history? Application point number two, whatever it is, there's grace. Confess, receive forgiveness. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. And maybe you want to take a picture of this so you can rehearse this, it's something that you could just come back to this week. This phrase. Because God loves me, I can be others focused, free of guilt and take responsibility for my words and actions. Let's read that out loud together. Ready, go. Because God loves me, I can be others focused, free of guilt and take responsibility for my words and actions. God wants to heal every one of us, restore each one of us, purify us so that we can get on with the business of bringing goodness and light and healing wherever God sends us, in every vocation, workplace, neighborhood, school. God wants to do good things through us. And when we're believing that terrible lie, we cannot open our eyes up to the wonderful things that God wants to do.